Okay, in our last section, we're going to talk about spatial attention and how that interacts with object recognition to support the ability to recognize objects in crowded visual scenes. And a classic kind of uh, pop culture example of this is the Where's Waldo books, which you may have spent too much time uh, doing at some point. That's uh, an example of where you need to focus sequential attention on small regions of space because there's so many distractors, so many other possible stimuli that have many common features. And the only way that we have to kind of isolate that the exact same set of features that, that belong to Waldo um, are in that particular location is by sequentially focusing our attention. So attention plays a really important role in object recognition. Um, and it ties into the fovea that we talked about in the previous section about how that's where we focus our high resolution image processing. The other phenomenon we're gonna look at is the very surprisingly common uh, uh, phenomenon that happens with strokes. Uh, it emerges just because there's a particular artery that happens to be in a particular location uh, that is commonly affected with strokes that causes damage to the right-hand uh, side of your brain and uh, as a result of that crossover produces a neglect of the left-hand side of visual space. And so these pictures here are perhaps the most uh, kind of artistic way of capturing this um, from self-portraits of an artist who suffered from this uh, neglect uh, stroke kind of phenomenon. And you can see early on the self-portraits were completely blank on the left-hand side of space and pretty sparse overall. So you had a globalized effect of, you know, when you have a stroke, it's, it's very damaging globally. You have lots of uh, overall generalized brain responses. But then as this person recovered slowly over time, you can see a, a significant amount of cover, recovery and indeed a significant amount of filling in of this previously missing left-hand side of space but still, even in this recovered version of the self-portrait, there's less detail on the left-hand side of space compared to the right-hand side of space. Another example that's commonly used in the kind of more clinical case is you give uh, patients these uh, sheets of paper with lines on them, and you say, please uh, draw a line down the middle of every line on this sheet of paper. And this shows you two interesting effects. One is that um, lines on the left-hand side of the larger overall sheet of paper end up being neglected, so you can't, they're not bisected at all. And then within each individual line, you also see that the, the bisections tend to be over on the right-hand side. And this demonstrates uh, the fact that the uh, spatial attention that we have can kind of zoom in and focus on a small region of space and when you're focused on that individual line, you're neglecting the left-hand side of the line, but it can also zoom out and look and focus on the overall sheet of paper, in which case you're neglecting the left-hand side of paper. And so this indicates that we have a kind of resumable attentional field and that the brain damage is producing a, an effect at um, kind of however we zoom that. So um, this indicates maybe we have a shared common representation of 2D space and uh, there is some process that kind of also takes that space and fills it up or shrinks it depending on our overall window of attention. And we still don't really understand how that works, but that seems like a, a reasonable description of what's happening at least. Um, and another uh, example here is just uh, having people uh, copy uh, drawings and so you can see if patients are asked to draw a clock, they neglect the left-hand side of the clock. And this is really interesting because you can definitely see, well, you know, people should know semantically that there are all these numbers over on the left-hand side. And so they should know that they're missing those when they draw them. And there's some striking videos where people sort of say, yeah, that's everything. Yep, I got every, all the numbers. I'm not missing any. And yet there they are. And so uh, clearly it's a very pervasive uh, kind of uh, effect and one of the things that we talk about when we describe these kinds of phenomena is anasagnosia, which is the inability to know that you don't know something. 
And if part of your if the part of your brain that that recognizes and encodes visual space is just missing, it's almost like us not knowing what it feels like to be a bat and have sonar. Don't know, you know, we don't have that part of our brain. We never did, but that's no different than somebody who is missing some part of their brain. Um, it's gone. It's not there. And therefore, you don't have the ability to pay attention to it. And so, indeed, when you ask people about these effects, they gradually become aware over time that they're kind of missing this ability to focus on the left-hand side of space. But it's a very abstract kind of understanding. They don't really see what they're missing on a detailed kind of case-by-case -case basis. One of the most common tasks used to study uh, visual attention in general and also at these patients with neglect is the Posner spatial cueing task named for Michael Posner, a very influential cognitive psychologist. You have two different types of trials, a validly cued trial and an invalidly cued trial. And the validly cued trials are typically about 80% of the trials, so that's what uh, people learn to, to sort of trust the cue. Um, and these are the two kind of frames in time. So time is flowing down the page here. Um, and what you what happens is you have the cue drawing attention to one side of space, and then a briefly flashed target shows up on that side of space. And the, the subject's uh, job is simply to respond when they see that target. And what you see is that compared to a neutral condition where there is no drawing of attention to one side of space, that validly cued trial results in about a 20 millisecond improvement in speed in detecting the target. And so the idea is and it's actually too fast for your eyes to move um, the interval between the cue and the target. The idea is that there's some kind of covert form of attention, not overt in terms of moving your eyes, but covert. But as if you moved your mental eye inside your head, um, that attentional window or attentional spotlight, we talk about it as, uh, over to that side of space when the cue comes on and then when the target shows up you've kind of already primed processing in that part of space and therefore you can detect the target much faster. And interestingly on the invalid the cue trials uh, you get the cue here and you do not know at this point that this is going to be an invalid cue. So presumably you draw your attention over to that side of space but lo and behold the target shows up on the wrong side of space so to speak on the opposite side of space and uh, you get a sort of proportional, also additional amount of slowing in that case, uh, about 20 milliseconds in addition relative to this neutral case. So uh, you get both a speed up for valid trials and a slowdown for invalidly queued trials. And then uh, when you have spatial neglect, and in particular, kind of opposite of this particular example, but where the, the target shows up on the other side of space, and you cue the, the good side of space. So the good side of space typically in this neglect case is on the right-hand side. If you show the target over on the left-hand side of space in this invalidly cued case, uh, people are differentially slow to, to draw attention over there. But interestingly, when you kind of normalize the overall reaction time, they don't see any effects for the neutral and valid cases, um, which are shown on the right-hand side of space. And Posner, uh, as was typical of uh, many researchers in his generation, proposed a classic kind of cognitive psychology model for this task involving uh, a series of kind of discrete cognitive operations like alerting and interrupting and localizing. And these were just kind of logical steps that you might need to, to do if you were to write a computer program. Uh, the metaphor at this time was very much that the brain is like a, a computer program. And so uh, you would think about, oh, well, these are the different information processing steps we would need. And if you have a particular dif difficulty in responding in an invalidly cued case, Posner reasoned this must be a result of a deficit in the disengage box. And so he hypothesized that this is the specific location in this sequence of overall uh, cognitive operations where the damage kind of affected in neglect. However, that does not account for effects of bilateral damage, uh, which actually kind of paradoxically, according to the boxology story, actually produce a improvement in speed, a reduction in attentional focus deficits, being inconsistent with this overall model, but is consistent instead with a more kind of biologically based model 
which is uh, based on, as we've been talking about many times, the idea that the visual system has a where pathway going off and an object what pathway, and that those two interact with each other, both kind of top down, bottom up through their interactions with V1, but also laterally as direct connections between these two pathways. And this is in fact the model that we're gonna look at, uh, and we'll see that it accounts for not only the, the basic uh, kind of effects of um, neglect as you see in this case, but also the effects of bilateral damage.